This episode is brought to you by MPB. Get cash for the kit you're not using or trade it in for the gear you want at mpb.com. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, we're gonna dive deep into what it takes to conceptualize and build a thriving photography business, basically from soup to nuts, and doing it at an early stage of your career and crush it you know, beyond what people in later stages of their career are doing. Jeremy Elder is that guy. He's done that. He's the, um, I'm gonna make sure I don't get this wrong, he's director of brand partnerships and the lead photographer at uh, Boulder Media House. And we're gonna find out what that means and how he's able to basically build a ridiculously successful business so quickly. Jeremy, how's it going, man? How you doing? Fantastic, thanks for having me. Yeah, it is good to have you, man. I, I'm excited to chat about this. You and I have chatted, we chatted, a, what, about a week or so ago, right? And kind of did our little pre-interview thing where we were just shooting the breeze. And man, I came away with my my mind sort of blown at what you, what you did and, and the, I don't know, I guess the vector, the direction and the thrust, you know, behind where you guys are going. So let's start there. Let's start with just a little bit of an, a, a backgrounder on who, Jeremy is and where you guys are, you know, kind of what led you to where you're sitting right now, kind of the Reader's Digest version. Perfect. Yeah. So a little background on myself. Uh, My name is Jeremy Elder. I'm 24 years old, currently living in Denver, Colorado. And I hate you already. Just I just want to say that I hate (laughs) you. (laughs) Living living there and being that young, I hate you. No, but I'm kidding. But go ahead. (laughs) We're, we're definitely spoiled out here. That, yeah. is, that is for sure. Great people, great weather, great activities. We got it all. Yeah. Um, but I started the uh, creative journey when I was really a, a little kid with a uh, disposable camera. And I took a lot of photos of the floor and the ceiling. Um, and then in, uh, in high school, I uh, got a camera for Christmas from my mom and I haven't put it down since. So that kind of uh, launched me into the, uh, the creative space and started getting my passion for it and uh, started making some money off of it. And then in college, while I was attending CU Boulder, I met three other amazing and incredibly talented individuals. And we started Boulder Media House. And it started as a way to make a little extra beer money and go to concerts for free. Nice. So <laughs> we we really didn't have any plans of, you know, building a building a real company and pursuing this after college. But we started getting clients left and right, and the whole thing ran away from us very quickly. And we were producing some amazing content with really cool companies and brands and uh, just getting to work with some awesome people um, and fun projects. And we've definitely been very fortunate with some of the brands and, uh, and projects we've worked on. Um, And we started as, yeah, four of us in my living room, which was a very, very tiny space in the summer in Boulder. How many many square feet? No air conditioning maybe like a hundred <laughs> 150 it was That's a small. garage it was it's, oh, literally wow. there was enough room for the dining room table which was a four-person table and we had four monitors on there and computers underneath and we would use fans just kind of box fans in the summer to cool down the computers so they wouldn't overheat while we were trying to work nice. um and then we quickly outgrew that space, thank God, and <laughs> moved into our first um, first office in Boulder. And six months later, had to move into a bigger space. And now we are a team of 12 with a studio warehouse uh, in Rhino and actually looking at a new space right now because it's 
it's that time time to move again <laughs> and it's growth man and then just just to draw a circle around that who depending on when you're viewing this in, or listening to this interview we are in mid-september of 2021 so if you know your history as you're listening to this you know that we are still currently in a covid 19 pandemic situation so you're able to do this and build this throughout all that because it's been going on for what 18 months you know knocking on two years now so what were the challenges there building building a successful business that i would argue is a high touch person to person business right in under the the shadow of a pandemic and social distancing and all that that stuff definitely yeah in uh in march when we first hit lockdown we lost 95 percent of our upcoming contracts so we got hit really hard thankfully we had enough money in the bank account to pay our rent and and then some and um it was definitely definitely a scary scary time because all our projects were in person they were on location um, usually, uh, at the client's location and, um, we, we had to pivot. So we started doing a lot more product based work, um, animation work, motion graphics, and that definitely helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. And we moved, um, what was that? That was August of 2020. We moved down into the, the current space that we're at right now, but it was tough. It, <laughs> It was a lot of Zoom meetings that lasted for four to five hours, and they were productive, and then they were very unproductive. Um, after four hours on a call, there's there's not much much you can do. You really need to be in person for what we're yep. doing is yep. is what we found. Um, but yeah, it was definitely very tricky, and thankfully now we can be back to all our in person shooting. Um, and you know just being able to to move around now there are still some restrictions sure, um yeah. and a lot of times you know we're we're still masked up on set and uh when things first started coming back you know we our team was getting covid tests almost every other week just just to be safe and we had a couple scares but thankfully thankfully everyone on our team is is a-okay and you know those projects went off without a hitch I love that. So when you talk about the, the projects and those clients that you guys got hit with, which is congratulations, right? That's the dream of starting a photography business is hanging out that shingle and then having the problem of bandwidth and being able to satisfy all those customers. What what do those customers look like? What kind of photography are we talking about? Is it commercial? Are we talking wedding, portraiture? What was it? A little bit of everything. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll break down our company a bit too. So we we service almost every creative output that our clients need so that's video that's animation motion graphics photography um, design website development we're doing a bit of everything which is nice because you know some clients they might need photo work other clients they might need you know a brand anthem video so that definitely helps a lot and we have some extremely talented individuals on our team um, and our CEO, Bailey, he's been able to just kind of guide us, uh, drive the ship into this fantastic direction. So it's it's definitely been a challenge and we've learned so much over the past year, so many ups and downs. But I mean, with without those ups and without those downs, it would be kind of boring, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, for sure. And then it's it's the whole thing is a journey, right? It's a learning process and you have to you have to be having fun on that journey in order or and have a goal at the end of the line in order for it to be sustainable. Because if one of those exactly. things aren't in place, then you got no goal. Then you're just kind of driving around aimlessly. Right. And if you, you you're not having fun doing what you're doing, what's the point? You know, switch gears and do something exactly. else. Yeah. Exactly. And that was the whole the whole point of, you know, kind of starting this this project was we were all extremely passionate creatives and we wanted to work on bigger projects so it was the idea of all right well one person has a limit but if you start working with more you can expand the scope of your projects and ideally work on bigger projects and that's thankfully exactly what what happened yeah yeah so let, take me through a day in the life of on a, a particular project let's say a portrait shoot 
you know, someone calls you guys up, you know, they're in Boulder and you're like, hey, I want to do a I want to do a portrait shoot or maybe it's a headshot shoot for a, for an actor or a model or something. What's the flow? Do they I'm assuming they don't call you up. Do they hit you up on Instagram? Do, do they come to your website and fill out a contact form? What's the what's the ingest flow? So for for those types of projects, definitely more so um, inbound leads. So that is that is Instagram. That is um, our website, the contact form. We don't, yeah, we don't really get a lot of calls for those types of projects. Usually the calls are, you know, just inquiring about possibly bigger projects. But most of the inbound, um, you know, leads and potential clients, those all come through our website. But uh, it, it depends on the shoot. So if it's, say, a smaller shoot, you know, a smaller portrait shoot, we'll, we'll have... A photographer and a stylist on set and you know if we're doing that in the studio we're gonna set the studio up make sure it's it's looking nice and and client facing mm-hmm. yep. um get all our props organized and uh and then try and get to know you know the talent the model whoever it is try and get to know them a little bit because i feel like when you have that personal relationship with someone the shoots are so much easier because there's there's a trust built up and there's a sense of, you know, friendship as well. It's not just a transactional thing. It's more of a relationship based. And then on the bigger, uh, shoots, let's say it's for, for a fashion company. Um, that's where we bring in our, our fantastic producer, Tori. So she's going to be really organizing all the logistics, you know, getting our, uh, location permits filled out, getting all our, uh, release forms done. Um, you know, coming up with the call sheet and hiring the talent, sending the client options on who the talent's going to be, getting our stylist in. You know, if there's there's props involved, you know, maybe we have a prop stylist as well. So there's definitely a lot more hands-on aspects and, and more team members needed on the bigger shoots, which is really great because for the longest time, it was it was like the one person does everything and that just got chaotic and you know, things were falling through the cracks. So really having those teammates that are really, really good in certain lanes has streamlined the process so much. And it just helps to, you know, you free up some some mental space um, and then you can really focus on the project and you're not stressed out as much as you would be if you're trying to manage everything by yourself. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's so it, it, that's so forward thinking, right? Because the, in in a lot of industries, the knee jerk reaction is going to be, you know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it all myself. You know, I'm guilty of doing a lot of that. You know, I'm going to do it all myself. No one is ever going to do it to the degree that I think it should be done. I could just knock it out myself and then multiply, knock it out yourself times 100 and you're knocked out. Right. So exactly. out, outsourcing, you've got a producer, you've got someone, you know, that's taking care of that stuff. So you as the photographer and the team of photographers can focus on actually engaging with the client and creating good, good photography. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So yeah. what, Oh, go ahead. You're going to say something. Oh, I, I was just going to say, and then, you know, on the, the bigger video production shoots, that's just, you know, 10 times the amount of people and logistics going on. So that's also really where it's like, all right, we have dedicated people and this just streamlines the whole process. And, and it is the delegation. It's putting the right people in the right place. Um, and really trusting those individuals to know what they're going to do. No one needs to micromanage the project. And also, you know, we're, we're firm, all the, all the partners at our company, we're firm believers of hiring individuals and, you know, maybe other companies that we're working with that are much more talented than ourselves yeah. to bring them on so that, you know, we can just level up all the work that we're doing. And I think that's, that's also something that, that we learned is, it's it's so much more beneficial to hire people that are better than you yeah yeah that's right yeah and then you then you focus on the things that you are the best at and that you enjoy everybody's happy yeah so so then with all the with all that logistics and the the teams you say you had 12 people working in there you got producers you you know and then i'm assuming contractors that come in from time to time like makeup artists and stylists and those sorts of entities how do you manage the communication i gotta i gotta assume it's not just a just endless emails flying back and forth Uh, what what's the secret sauce in communication it it definitely depends on the project but um 
on the bigger things, Tori is, she's sending out lots of different emails. There's a kickoff call. And that's where we try and get as many people as possible that are working on a project together so that we can run through all the ideas, um, you know, the shot list, mood board, whatever it, it is, so that everyone's on the same page. Um, but a lot of times, I feel like it is it is a lot of emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was I was halfway expecting you to say, "Oh yeah, we're on Slack and we communicate we, back and forth." We are. So our whole okay. team internally, everything's on Slack, and most of our projects we're utilizing all our our in house team. Um, yeah. It, you know, for for hair and makeup for talent that that of course we're bringing in contractors for it. but um everything else that's internal it's all slack so yeah. thank thank god for slack yeah because you'd have a mountain of email if it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't for slack yeah yeah so then so day of right and i know i know i'm i'm oversimplifying the whole thing right so but when you when you're doing the loadout let's so go back to that example you're the photographer on this one i know you have a group and you know i'm not sure how it round robins but you drew the long or short straw or whatever for this particular client and you're going to be the photographer um what does the night before look like for you are you going through your bag do you have a bag that's already set to go in the studio like how does how does the i call it the old remember that old series the a-team they used to have a yep they used to have a, a montage of them getting ready to go into whatever situation they were going to move into. I imagine that for you, you're, right? you're getting ready and loading up that bag. What does it look like? Yep. Yep. Exactly like that. You know, fueling up the helicopter. And... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sedating, uh, sedating Mr. T. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, it's, it's definitely, we try and, pre-plan ahead of yeah. time as much as possible. So we'll have a prep day. So, you know, yesterday there were um, a few of us on set. It was a 15 hour day and there was some gear that we'd never worked with before. So we got that gear two days before the shoot just to, you know, start playing around with it, setting everything up, um, making sure that we could operate it properly. Um, so the prep days are extremely important as well as like, you know, that day is dedicated towards picking up any rental gear that we need um, and kind of last minute plans. If anything's changed, um, you know, making sure the weather is going to be fine day of it's there's definitely a prep day um, where kind of all those things happen. And yeah, for, you know, say hypothetically, I'm I'm the lead photographer on that. Um, that is that is the day I'm packing all my gear up, making sure I got all my batteries on the chargers SD cards are all formatted, um, you know, everything's just ready so that once we get on site, we're, we're just good to go. Yeah. You want, you want anything, any surprises to happen the night before, right? Uh, like exactly. This, exactly. This camera decided not to work today, you know, or whatever you want all that happen, all that to happen the night before. So what, what does that look like gear wise though? What do you, you know, Again, it's going to be project dependent, but what are you taking with you on a portrait shoot? Usually um, two different bodies, of course, for the, the oh no situation in case one yeah. of them doesn't work. Of course, um, yeah. I am, so I'm a Sony shooter, so I am a sucker for my, my G Master lenses. <laughs> um, those bad boys are very nice. Um, so <laughs> you, look at, you look like you're trying to contain yourself. I'm just, just going to say they're very just, nice. That's it. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> um, they are great. Um, but, uh, yeah, putting all the lenses that I need. I mean, obviously depending on the shoot, what it is, got to make sure you have your, your zooms, your wides, uh, any primes that you're going to need. Uh, of course we're all in hypotheticals right now, but Say we're we're shooting at the sand dunes, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna want some awesome close up shots and then, you know, we're at the dunes. So let's get some wide shots too, because the, mm -hmm. the landscape there is just phenomenal. Um so yeah, really trying to to plan all that out, especially if we have a shot list. Um, then it's like, all right, we know exactly what we're trying to get. So let's pack all the gear that we need. And let's try not to pack the gear that we don't need, and that's just gonna add extra weight and more things to think about. You know what? It's 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 refreshing that you said that because that 
That when I was first starting on photography, as we discussed during the uh, during the pre-interview, which was quite a while ago, right? Um, my my newbie, you guys are you know obviously not newbies, but when I was a when I was a new photographer, my knee jerk reaction was to go Batman, right? I was like, you know what, I gotta have everything with me so that I could cover whatever happens to show up. If aliens land over there, I need my 7200. <laughs> if I see a little tiny bug that looks interesting, I need the macro, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was that, and it wasn't until, you know, like a decade later that, that I came to the realization that you just articulated that, you know, what are you shooting and bring the stuff to shoot that. Maybe a little bit extra and some redundancy, yep. of course, but, you know, you don't need to be Batman. You need to be more like uh, James Bond, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. What can you fit under the suit? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, a Walter PPK, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it, 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 and I mean, there is the whole saying of, you know, better to have it and not need it, but there's an extent to that. Especially yes. since, I mean, we have, we have tons of gear. And it's like, well, I'm not going to bring 20 different lenses. That's just not practical yeah Um, yeah but not to mention if you get robbed or something and then now you're you're out of that much money when you didn't need to be because you'd be like wow i I, did i really need to bring all that and now it's gone right so yeah yeah yeah. well so so then on the site you know so you're shooting if again using our hypothetical example of a you know a, a portrait shoot or a headshot shoot something like that Who's there with you? Is it you and the client? Is it you, the client, and a makeup artist, and a stylist, and an assistant? Is it kind of that that Andy Leibovitz entourage with you, or are you going just you and the client and the camera, and you guys are out there collaborating? How does that work for you? I, again, really, really situational. Um, yeah. Kind of dependent on what the shoot is. I love, especially if it's, you know, let's say, yeah, an outdoor lifestyle portrait shoot. Um, I'm, I love natural light and for, for, for the outdoor situations. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, some indoor, so, some indoor. It's okay. yeah, 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 definitely. I feel like in the studio setting, I, I love using artificial light, but also, I mean, I'm still learning. There's so many different things that you can do with strobes and modifiers. And I feel like that is, that is an endless learning oh, yeah. journey. That no one will ever fully master, <laughs> no. which is fun. Um, but yeah, it might just be me and the client or me, the client, and, and you know, the client is a brand and talent, an assistant, stylists, makeup artist. Um, uh, we have a, an awesome uh, junior creative director on our team. She doubles as our, as our stylist. She is great. Um, I love bringing her on shoots because she has – a really cool perspective, um, especially with a lot of different, um, you know, poses. And, uh, I like having, I like having another set of eyes and opinions from my team on set. Um, cause I think the best work is done when you have your full team behind you and your full team collaborating and working on a project. And that's what we found every single time. It's the projects where all of us are involved from pretty much start to finish. Those are the, those are the real, you know, portfolio pieces. Those are the ones that are going on the website. Those are the ones that we feel are just our, our greatest work. Um, now when it's just, you know, one of us going out, it's still good work. But when you get the whole, the whole force of a team behind you, that is, feel like an unstoppable force. And how, Jeremy, how do you guys ideate on the look of a particular shot? I know some photographers, some fashion photographers I speak with, some of them say, you know, they'll get on Pinterest and just start, make a board and just start pinning ideas for different directions and they'll share that with the client so the client can kind of be on the same page and, and interject with some pins of their own. How do you guys kind of figure out what that that concept is going to be definitely yeah pinterest is awesome um i love creating mood boards on pinterest and also like incorporating some things that i've seen on instagram i have so many different saved photos that i've seen um over the past few years and kind of in in different uh categories you know so photo shoot and then 
you know, I have one that's product based or lifestyle based. Nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think Pinterest is a fantastic resource, um, to build up the mood board and really showcase the idea, but also just bouncing ideas off each other, uh, internally and seeing, seeing which ones we can all agree on are, you know, the coolest and would look the best and kind of convey what the client wants to convey the most, yeah. you know? Yep. Yep. And get everybody literally on the same page. What is, you know, I'm, I'm curious and I like to ask photographers from time to time who, who they admire the most, you know, and, and it's ne not necessarily another photographer or someone's work, but just someone, you know, could be an Elon Musk or somebody like that. Like, who do you, like, who are you looking at thinking that person has got it figured out and I want to I want to aim my ship in that direction. Mm -hmm. I have always loved the work from Jimmy Chin and Chris Burkard. Those two, I feel like they just create timeless pieces and that is something I'm always striving towards is creating something that's timeless. Yeah. Um so they're huge inspirations for me personally. Um, and then from the team, there's a few different, you know, production agencies that every time they put something out, we're, we're trying to dissect how they did it and how they made it. Um, and I feel like, honestly, just social media in general, I'd say is a big influence in a good way, um, mm -hmm, just because... Mm -hmm you can search something and there's so many different point of views that come across from it. Um, so that and, and friends, um, we definitely try and surround ourselves with other amazing creatives and see what they're working on and be like, Oh, this is awesome. You know, how could we do something similar, but put our own spin to it and maybe, you know, collaborate with them. Um, but also just everything that the rest of my team, puts out and everyone that works here it's it's really inspiring to see what they do um, I love it. they are all so much more talented than me it's, see, it's just you, awesome humble. being able to work with them <laughs> humble and humility i love it um when you're when you're you know so going through that day of right so we've scheduled you've interacted with the client you've collaborated you got the mood board you're out there with your sony and you've shot you know and you're coming back with the images then what you know, so and I'll, I'll, I'll frame this as I know some photographers, some pro photographers will say, yeah, uh, I take that that SD card or CF card or whatever card and I give it to somebody and they know my look and they do all the processing and retouching. And then they show me the gallery and I approve the images and it goes to the client and others would never have that. Right. It's I take those images and I sit down at the computer and I go to town and I make them be all they can be. Where, where do you fall on that? I I definitely like doing all the the post-production work myself yeah. yep. um i think if it is a higher you know let's say it's a shoot for nike for example for something like that i'd want to put my own spin to it make sure everyone else on the team feels that is it is you know to our standard and then probably get a, a professional retoucher involved because mm -hmm. the work that some of those retouchers can do Oh my God. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's so cool. And it's really cool that that's just a profession is kind of finalizing, finalizing something for someone else and for another client, but being able to, you know, utilize their vision and their style to create the final piece. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting, what about weddings? I know you, when we spoke before, you mentioned you have a wedding division as well of the company. Is it the same kind of flow there or cause weddings are a little bit more commoditized, right? So you're not going to need mm -hmm. to necessarily hire a, a, an external retoucher to handle that. How do, how do, how does that more mainstream flow work? Totally. That is so, yeah, I guess I can kind of, cause we broke that down on the, the, uh, pre-call um, yeah. our company so Boulder Media House is the the parent company and we own a few different brands under that and those are you know specific uh, markets and industries so one works with a lot of artists and you know anyone involved in the music industry one works with professional athletes primarily uh, NFL players and then the 
other is a, uh, a wedding videography company. So that they each kind of have their own teams, and those teams have been able to incorporate the style and you know flow that we we give off, and they each have a little bit of their own spin to it. But that definitely is a different workflow than our commercial projects. Mm -hmm. So we have some really awesome in-house editors that they know the style that's been cultivated over the past few years and the style that folks are, are hiring us for. Um, so they, they're just cranking away. But um, it definitely takes a little while to get them up to speed and to learn our style when we onboard someone new. Um, and that's, uh, that's, you know, quite a process because we're, we're putting out a very high quality product. Um, and we want to make sure that we're keeping everything to that, to that standard of quality. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, I want to, I want to wrap up and I have, I have a ton of questions here, but this could be like a three hour <laughs> discussion because <laughs> it's, you know, I love this stuff. I love the business of photography. I love the entrepreneurial side of it as well as the creative and people that are able to successfully merge those together uh, and have it kind of fuel their passion. It's just, it's fascinating to me. Um, this is a close the, close the, the loop on, software or, or the post-production side of things where do you land on that and this is this is part of my next uh segment that i'm gonna throw a rapid fire series of questions at you but the first one is an or which which post-processing tool do you lean towards lightroom or capture one or neither lightroom your lightroom interesting and why yeah i have never gotten into capture one i've almost gotten into it probably like 25 different times. Um, and then I had a shoot and I was like, all right, we're getting super busy. So I don't have time to learn this, this program yet. I'd like to get into capture one. Um, but it's a whole nother workflow to learn and I'm totally open to doing that, but we've been thankfully very busy. So I haven't really been able to set that time aside to really yeah. dive into it. Yeah, because you're you're too busy running a business and actually doing stuff to experiment with something you know that may or may not work for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's a rapid fire. Uh, this is a series of questions that will help the audience get a better understanding of who you are as a person and a photographer. So you ready? Oh boy! All right, let's do it. <laughs> first one. You answer the first one. Lightroom versus Capture One. You're a Lightroom guy. Uh, next one, and I hate that Lightroom guy banner. You're a photographer who currently is using Lightroom. That's who you are. Yes. Um, Mac or Windows? Oh man. Um, you could be both. It could be both. We <laughs> We are both for different okay. reasons. Um, mostly Windows because we can build pretty beefy rigs, especially for the rendering side of things. So if we're using Cinema 4D or After Effects, um, or you know just exporting a big Premiere project, um, we kind of need the the PCs to uh, to handle that. Um, and then I guess Mac for when we're on the road, um, it's just so nice and easy and compact. But wow. that that M1 chip is definitely uh, catching our eye. It is. It's catching mine too. You know, and I have I don't have any M1 hardware here yet. But that I'm I'm Mac obviously, and the mm -hmm. the next iteration or upgrade from my current setup hopefully will be M1. Um, okay, so Mac and Windows, we're, we're looking at. So the next logical question, I think you answered this already with your answer to the last one, Final Cut Pro or Premiere, your Premiere house, right? Yep, yep, that we are. We're, we're very loyal to Adobe. So Adobe, if you want to sponsor us or be one of our clients, we would love that. They may <laughs> be listening. I have some friends over there. Um, okay, next one is, uh, I'm going to throw a little foil in there. Marvel or DC? Marvel. <laughs> Marvel. Uh -huh. Okay. So you know the way. That's I just me. That? I can't. I can't. I can't speak for the rest of the team, but I personally Marvel. <laughs> Marvel. Marvel. This is the way I split it. Marvel for live action. DC for animation. Because mm. DC's animation is just gritty and real world, and 
you know, not safe for children, right? Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah. Marvel is more, well, Marvel and Disney, right? Synonymous. Right. Um, I was gonna say Marvel is more Disney, but they are Disney. Right? <laughs> so, um, okay, Android or iPhone? iPhone, used to be an Android guy back in middle school, but um, I think everything that Apple is doing is, is really cool. Yeah, what do you think of the new phone? Did you see the announcement? <laughs> I did. It uh, it looks pretty sweet. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, that cinematic mode. We were. I was recording an interview yesterday with a friend of mine, uh, Jefferson Graham, and we we're talking about the I, the whole thing behind that interview was, it, which will be released today as we we speak, uh, September sixteenth. Uh, but it was, can the iPhone be used for pro work now? You know. We, it could before, right, with the 12 and 11, whatever. But now we're on 13 with this crazy bionic processor in there and cinematic mode on the camera and raw and and ProRes and all this stuff. Can it legit be used? And his answer was, I'm curious how you're, you'll answer this. His answer was, yes, it can with an asterisk. There is currently still the theater of larger cameras being necessary for pro work, especially if a client is on set, right? So you're not going to show up with your iPhone taking pictures when that IO is like $25,000 and you're using the same phone that that guy's using, right? How do you fall on that? I mean, are iPhones ready for prime time yet? Or are they still kind of an experiment kind of keeping one eye on them? So I would say, yes, they can be used for professional work. Um, but sometimes it really, I mean, it is like you need certain certain tools for certain jobs. Yeah. So, you know, we've had some clients that they want project shot on on a phone because that's where it's going to get consumed by their clients. Mm -hmm. So, especially for, you know, TikTok content, um, Instagram content, any kind of social media platform, I think sometimes that raw grittiness that you get is going to convert a lot better than something that's really highly produced. Um, and I mean, that's what a client wants because if the work's not helping them, you know, sell a product or service or get a message across, then, you know, it's, it's not really doing them a service as much. Yep. Um, so I'd say yes, but I mean, like if you're shooting, a big billboard campaign, the sensor size is going to be a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're blowing something up and it's going to get pasted on the side of a giant skyscraper, then you might want something with a slightly bigger sensor. But I think it definitely can. And I think, I think iPhones have given so many people um, sources of income that that's that they didn't have before so i i definitely think it can be used yeah no i i tend to agree with you and wholeheartedly i agree with you on use the right tool for the right job i think photographers that's the industry i play in is it's probably true of just humans in general but photographers tend to use the word or when an and can be used just as easily right you know like i'm all in definitely. on iphone therefore i have to say no to anything that's not an iPhone and try to jerry-rig this iPhone to do things that that tool could probably do better much easier, right? So, yeah, yeah it doesn't, doesn't have to be an or. It can be an and sometimes, I think. So, yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's interesting. So I, I was doing some experiments with editing the, the last several episodes, probably including this one, um, on the iPad Pro using LumaFusion, which is a, a video nonlinear editing app for iOS. And and I use Final Cut. I'm a Final Cut guy. So I normally use Final Cut to edit, edit, and I'm I'm fluid in there. I got my templates. I can I can jam in Final Cut. When I started learning LumaFusion, it's a it's a completely different experience because it's obviously on a tablet, it's touch based, and you're using an Apple pencil to move clips around and it's just different. I, I find it more pleasurable, to be honest with you, because it, it mm -hmm. feels like a more intimate tactile tactile experience. But Here's the here's the feeling that I was feeling just last night. I was editing as I was editing. It feels like like if you're 
changing clothes in your house, right? You got the nice walk-in closet, it's comfortable, you're changing clothes, you're good to go, you check yourself in the mirror, you're out. On the iPad, it feels like changing clothes in the back of your car, right? <laughs> Have you ever done that? You ever had to change clothes in a vehicle? Yep. And you gotta yep. like, kind of Tetris yourself into place a little bit, and you can do it, and then you gotta get up to, to it, there's some restrictions and some yeah. of them are, are good, you know, and they, they drive creativity. Creativity drives or restrictions drive creativity. But some are just, OK, this is a little tight. This would be easier over there because all I'd have to do is select everything and do this. And, you know, so that's that's kind of where where I I fall on it. Do you, do you think you guys will ever add like well, like you said, yeah, clients that are specifically requesting footage shot on a mobile phone, but do you think you'll ever move closer to that world where it's it's kind of just part of your deliverables? I could see it in certain situations. So anything that requires an extremely fast turnaround time, say, you know, say we have to fly to, let's just say it's it's Europe for a project, right? And they need it turned around in say a day mm -hmm. if our whole team is traveling then we're gonna have to be working on that wherever we're at so that's where i feel like something you know as portable as an ipad would really come in handy you know a lot of the music work that we do there's very very fast turnaround times on that it's you know ideally they want it in an hour after the performance if possible wow. and so situations like that or if you're on tour you know if you're on a on a bus tour you can have your laptop but you're you're not going to be able to bring a desktop with you mm -hmm. you know i feel like there's pros and cons to it because with all our bigger commercial work that's where we really need we need a desktop setup mostly for the computing power that you can get um yeah. so Yes, I see it in certain situations, especially if there's a social campaign or something that would make sense and that's not quite as, you know, if we're not trying to go through two terabytes worth of footage um, or, you know, photos, that would be a lot of photos, yeah. um, uh, then it definitely makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's so interesting where things are going and where they might go and how that may mm -hmm. shift. Like you said, just give, giving you the, the capability to be able to be lean and mean when necessary and use that workstation. And this, like you mentioned before, that M1 processor that's in the iPad now, I have, I have never used one, but I would imagine once these software developers start really tapping into that thing and or an M2 processor or M1X or whatever shows up mm -hmm. that's just super computer level or something, then that also changes things because that whole, the whole argument about, well, I need a desktop for that horsepower and rendering speed and all that, if that goes out the window, then what, right? <laughs> so yeah. it just changes things. So what, what is next, Jeremy, for uh, Boulder Media House? Where, where are you guys going? If you, if you had your time machine and you could look into where you guys are going to be in, let's say, we're in 2022 or 2021 now, you're going to be, like, say, into 2023. Where do you want to be? Where do you want the company to be? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Just alive. I want it to be alive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, well, forward looking. I think ideally we want to be working on, I want to say less projects, but bigger projects. Mm -hmm. So we're able to dedicate more time to really build out big campaigns um, and be able to work on, you know, really big projects. So one of our, our other partners, Red, he's currently working on an hour-long documentary. So being able to work on more projects like that, that's definitely a direction that we want to be going in. Um, and also really working with mission-driven companies. That's something that we believe is really important. So we try and work with a lot of nonprofits as well as our commercial clients. Um, and 
use some of our talents to tell really impactful stories, tell meaningful stories that are helping our community and the greater community for good. So that's that's definitely something that we are really passionate about and feel is is very important. It's fun to work on all kinds of you know, super creative projects, and we love doing that. But I think it's also important to work on those those impactful projects that are going to help a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah. Altruism is often overlooked, right? In in the in the never ending kind of rush for dollars and clients and all that, the altruistic part of things typically get kind of pushed to the wayside until we're reminded by people like you that are thinking about it. So that's, that's awesome. Well, cool, man. So if people want to kind of connect with you online, and of course, I'll have all your, your information in the show notes for the YouTube video and of course the podcast show notes. But if somebody is listening to this right now and they need to, they feel compelled to reach out to you guys because they have a million dollar project that they need you to, to bid on, what's the, uh, what's the best way for them to get in t- contact with you? Well, if you have a million dollar project, <laughs> uh, definitely shoot me an email. We will hop on the phone and uh, I will fly to wh- wherever you are located. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely follow us on Instagram. We're at Boulder Media House. Um, our website is bouldermediahouse.com. Um, if you want to see some of the work that I'm doing, it's uh, Older Elder on Instagram. Um, but all of our all of our projects were. Uh, trying to post post more on uh on instagram so definitely check us out there shoot us a message we love connecting with other creatives and uh other individuals that are also trying to get into this space um and uh yeah if you're if you're in the uh, denver boulder area let us know we'd love to link up awesome awesome hey when the world thaws, I'm coming out there to hang out. I can't, I can't promise any skiing or anything, but <laughs> I could, I could promise some beer or something consumption. How about that? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, man, Jeremy. Always a pleasure uh, chatting with you. It's literally and an, and genuinely an inspiration to see what you are building and what your team has put together and where you guys are going. I can only imagine it's going to get amazing. Next next time we talk, you're going to have 25 employees working <laughs> and cranking in there and, and having a good time. So congratulations on all your successes and cheers. Here's to many more, man. And thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This you're has welcome. been awesome. You're welcome. You're welcome. We'll talk soon. Take care. Right. Jeremy. This is Twitter. This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit mpb.com.